As the war between Israel and Hamas continues in Gaza, the Jewish nation is now also battling another terrorist group at the border with Lebanon. To talk about this in more detail is our foreign affairs expert Lisa Daftari from the Foreign Desk who joins us once again from Los Angeles. Lisa, not only does Israel have to contend with Hamas, but also with Hezbollah once again. Will we see more civilian casualties as a result? This is a very complicated equation uh, when you want to bring in Hezbollah in the north uh, into the mix. So just as a background, Hezbollah is the number one proxy of Iran's regime. They began funding and training and giving weapons to Hezbollah in the early 80s, right after coming into power. Hezbollah is the more endowed, better trained, more sophisticated terror group of Iran's regime. So as to compare to Hamas, it would put up a much more difficult, much more challenging front and would also stretch, obviously, Israel's resources because they are all you know, fully uh, committed to uh, what's going on in Gaza. Can they handle it? Definitely. I, I, I do believe that they can. This is you know, a, a nation, a small nation like Israel, the size of New Jersey, that is surrounded by enemies and always has to be prepared for this kind of scenario. Now, the the, the main question here is, would Iran's regime give the directive to uh, Hezbollah to fully, um, it, you know, engage in in something uh, of a front with with uh, northern Israel, or are they just throwing pebbles as we're seeing now? So they're striking every single day. By the way, Hal, um, even though we haven't we haven't really acknowledged this as a full heated, um, you know, an escalation or a war between Hezbollah and northern Israel, but it has been happening every day, and Israel has been obviously um, evacuating areas. Um, getting the civilians out of out of the way and obviously responding to Hezbollah's missiles. But um, this is where the United States come in. The United States pays hefty checks to the Lebanese Free Army. Uh, there has to be contingencies here. You know, rein them in, control your cancer, uh, and don't don't let them get involved in this war. It will become a much more escalated war. And then obviously it goes on from there, right? We know the Houthis are in Yemen. We know there's insurgencies in Syria uh, and in Iraq. And of course, the United States not acknowledging the many hits that they have had on their assets in the region uh, in the last uh, two months or so. So, Lisa, why not go after Iran and itself as a country. If the United States approached the United Nations say, you know what, we need to go after Iran because that's the country which is funding so many of these terrorist organizations. Hal, I have had that question for many, many years. And of course, over the last two months, that is the main question. We also had that question in the aftermath of 9-11, when the United States went after Afghanistan and Iraq, but we knew that there was a lot of funding coming from Iran's regime. Uh, in the one breath, the United States just put out a, a report this weekend saying that Iran is the number one state sponsor of terror. So they understand that as a fact. On the other hand, they have removed vital sanctions that have allowed Iran to earn 60 to $90 billion in oil sales. They are giving them money uh, or unfreezing assets for them to give them more money, give them more leverage. And of course, going back to the nuclear negotiating table, which Hal, you and I know that Iran will not comply with any deal, any piece of paper, any pact or any nuclear deal. So then that becomes a question of policy. Why does the United States, knowing that they are the number one state sponsor of, of terror, knowing that they are striking U.S. assets, not just our ally Israel, but U.S. assets over 75 times over the last two months and ignore ignoring that and continuing on with this desire to normalize relations with Iran's regime instead of curbing them, giving them an ultimatum. And if you remember, they pussyfooted around the idea that Iran was even involved in supporting Hamas uh, in the October 7th attack. It took a very long time for the Pentagon, for the State Department, for the White House to connect the dots for us. We knew it was there, but to acknowledge the connection of Iran's regime in all of this. And of course, Hal, you and I, we spoke about the exposés, the reports that came out that we know Iran's regime not only funded, but trained uh, the militants that went in on October 7th. Lisa, Muslim American voters have vowed not to support U.S. President Joe Biden in the lead up to the next presidential election next year over the Gaza war. And there are reports that Muslim leaders in nine swing states have launched a campaign to kick the commander in chief from the White House. This is a catch-22 for the Muslim American community, because if you remember, um, they had a lot of issue with Donald Trump as well. They viewed the travel ban that tried to vet and tried to stop um, individuals from a long list of countries, including Venezuela and North Korea, but they called it a Muslim ban, if you recall, because many of those countries were, in fact, uh, Muslim-dominant countries. So now they believe if they step away from, from Biden, as they have because of his response to uh, what's going on in Gaza, that they would be giving their 
votes to Donald Trump. So they're actually caught in this, this catch 22. But let me rewind a bit. The um, Muslim American community, many of, of them are, are extremely upset with uh, Biden supporting Israel. They, they find it very difficult to acknowledge what happened on October 7th. They're finding it difficult to condemn Hamas, and they're finding it very difficult to accept uh, what's going on with the civilian casualties in Gaza. Of course, none of us want any civilian casualties in any of this, and I feel like it, you know, it, it's, it's something that Across the board, everyone is acknowledging that there are, um, you know, this is uh, uh, the, the the consequences of war that that nobody wanted, uh, and of course Israel did not want to get involved either. But what's ironic here, Hal, is that on both sides you have um, both the 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 supporters of Israel and the supporters of the Palestinians feeling like Biden's support has been lukewarm uh, or unacceptable to them. So when you watch the press briefings from the White House, it's interesting to see, you know, the questions that are coming in are mostly about civilian casualties. And I, I've seen John Kirby do this. I've seen the Pentagon do this. I've seen Biden, President Biden do this, you know, obviously acknowledging the, the civilian casualties, but obviously standing with Israel's right to defend itself and supporting their agenda to decimate Hamas. Now, Lisa, speaking of the civilian casualties and victims, it took 56 days for the United Nations to condemn Hamas's alleged multiple rapes of Israelis. Let me ask you, what took them so long? It's it's really horrific. It, you know, how how many times a month do we say what the heck is going on at the U.N.? Why do they put the Iranian regime at the head of, of committees dealing with human rights and women's rights? Why do they condemn Israel over uh, terror groups like Hamas? And what took them so long? Maybe they felt as though if they acknowledge that rape happened, that they burned children alive, that they chopped off women's breasts and played with them, that they would have to say that October 7th happened, that Hamas is a terror organization, and they would have to condemn them. And they just didn't want to. They didn't want to credit Israel with anything. That is the culture of the UN. I'm embarrassed to say I have spoken for the women's groups at the UN. I have briefed the UN on many of these topics. And I'm so embarrassed to say that this committee or this org body or this organization is entrusted with representing the nations of the world and they cannot condemn terrorism, then where do we all stand? If they cannot condemn terrorism, if they can't stand behind women and say rape is not resistance, um, it's, it's, it's a very, very uh, backwards culture at the UN that definitely needs some, some reforming, that's for sure. A Hamas leader by the name of Sinwar, the architect of the October 7th Hamas attack in Israel, said during the recent ceasefire last week that more attacks are to come. And then what we saw on October 7th was just a rehearsal, Lisa. That attack on October the 7th left around 1,400 people dead, and it was the deadliest day for the Jewish people since the Holocaust. Right. And when you say 1,400 dead, that doesn't do the story justice. When you look at the footage of how these families were burned alive, how babies were put in ovens, uh, how these Hamas militants then sat down and ate the family's lunch. The fact that they can't even uh, really uh, connect the DNA to the individual to 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 actually report on the or identify the, the bodies of the of the dead. But when you hear statements like this, and this is the second one that has come out in the last two months, one was a Hamas leader saying that they will do this again and again and again. And now uh, Sinwar saying that this was just a rehearsal. It becomes clear that their agenda is to eliminate Israel. This is not about resistance. This is about actual genocide on their part. They want it's a part of the Hamas charter to eliminate Israel, not to live side by side with Israel, but to eliminate Israel. And when you hear these words, obviously these threats prove that that Hamas and all these other terror organizations supported by Iran's regime, they, they present an existential threat to Israel, making it not just Israel's duty to, to eliminate Hamas for Israel, but for the rest of the free world. We are naive to think that there won't be another attack like 9-11 in, 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 uh, in the Eastern Hemisphere, here, Western Hemisphere here in the United States, in Canada, uh, in Europe. We are seeing a stabbing over the weekend in France, and it will continue. They want to tell us that they're here and that they have something to prove. It, did, it didn't start or stop with October 7th, and that's what we have to keep in mind. Lisa, we've seen the tunnels Hamas built under a hospital in Gaza, where some of the command centers were set up. There are also reports that the Israeli military has uncovered around 800 shafts to Hamas tunnels below Gaza. It's everywhere.
Right. And you wonder who who's funding these. Right. We want to, uh, you know, go back to the mainstream media and all these different uh, human rights groups and say, you, know, you talk about, you know, the poor Palestinian people. And I do feel for the Palestinian people. This is the reason they are poor, because every resource they have had, every dime that they have had has gone into terrorism, into building tunnels, into building weapons, into delivering these paying off the families of those who blow themselves up in the name of this resistance, in the name of jihad. And, you know, this is the complexity and the sophistication that Israel has to now, you know, kind of uncover and dismantle in order to live side by side in a Gaza that they evacuated in 2005, thinking that that would be the resolution to all of this, giving them all of Gaza, giving them the West Bank, allowing them to live there. Um, but knowing that they all this time, their fixation was on building terror tunnels. Their fixation was on delivering you know, terror attacks. Their fixation is on recruiting uh, terrorists who will blow themselves up in the name of their cause. And this is the reality that we are uncovering. And, you know, we're seeing more reports of terrorist attacks coming in. One in Paris recently where a tourist was killed and two others were injured after the attacker used a knife and a hammer. And there were also reports of a bombing at a church in the Philippines. Exactly. And, and both of these were claimed um, and, and confirmed to be terror attacks. Um, Again, you know, the, the guy in Paris uh, was screaming Allah Akbar and said that he was very much uh, upset by what is going on in Gaza, in the Philippines. The Islamic State claimed responsibility for that. The other message here is that it is not just against Jews. It is not just against Israelis. Um, in the Philippines, it was Christians. You know, in 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 France, you don't you know, they're either French or they're tourists or whatever they are. This is an attack against the free world. It's an attack against those who do not fold under this this jihad um, agenda. And when you think about it, Hal, to see all of these professors here in the West, when you see college campus protests, when you see this woke, um, you know, mob, when you see it on mainstream media outlets, do you wonder why they would ever support this jihad agenda when they're after them as well? Um, all these different social justice groups, women's groups, I mean, they're not condemning Hamas. They're actually supporting what's going on um, it, with Hamas and, and, and against Israel. They are supporting a resistance. All of a sudden, women's groups are silenced, silenced about rape, just like the UN. Uh, so I think we, we need a shift in narrative here. 20 years ago, uh, these jihadis, they doubled down on an agenda to use what the West uses in terms of intellectualism, in terms of propaganda, it, meaning social media and the mainstream media, um, you know, just flooding our minds, our eyes, wherever we are, finding influence to to push this, this jihadi agenda. And very unfortunately, they found these these fools uh, that will be accomplices to to their agenda and that's why we are where we're at it's very very sad and it's very very complex but they have been working on it for a while let's also talk about the number of anti-israel rallies we've seen across north america especially at our post-secondaries and it turns out one palestinian terrorist group co-sponsored an anti-israel rally at a princeton university recently lisa Shame on Princeton, on Columbia, on many of the other universities where we have seen not only a you know a support of these of these student groups, but professors that come out and say that they were thrilled, that they were that they found the October seventh attack exhilarating. These individuals are radicalizing and brainwashing the future of our countries in terms of, of instead of teaching them, instead of really showing them the the difference between right and wrong. What happened on October seventh has nothing to do. With with politics, but totally has to do with morality. And they have it all wrong. Um, it, you know, I've, I'm talking to a lot of parents who have have children under that age of college uh, age, and they're they're saying if it continues the way it is, you know, none of us want our kids to go to college. I mean, that's a crazy thing to say, but that just goes to show you how much the college that college culture has deteriorated. You don't go there to become enlightened, but you go there to become brainwashed by professors like these who support and push this, this radicalized agenda. Interesting how a lot of parents talk about homeschooling their kids when they're younger. Maybe we'll have to do the same thing for the kids the, you know, when they go to college or university or just take all your courses online. She's the host of The Foreign Desk and our foreign affairs expert, Lisa Daftari. Thanks so much for joining us once again from Los Angeles.
My pleasure.